When you're working with microorganisms, there are several guidelines to follow to make your work safe. Your laboratory will have its own rules for conduct and safety, for example, wearing safety glasses or gloves, dealing with spillages and disposal of contaminated waste, and you'll need to be aware of these procedures before you start work. This video gives information on the safe handling and manipulation of microorganisms using basic techniques, and a couple of examples of more sophisticated experiments are also mentioned. Although most species of microorganisms represent minimum risk when handled correctly, it's good laboratory practice to treat all cultures as if they are potentially harmful. It's important that you are dressed appropriately. Always wear a lab coat to protect your clothes from spills and splashes of cultures. Tie back long hair. Wash your hands thoroughly, making sure fingernails are clean. Never eat, drink or chew in the lab. In fact, nothing, including fingers and pen, should be put in your mouth. Never pipette by mouth or lick labels. Cover cuts and abrasions with a waterproof dressing before any work is done. Before starting work, wipe down the bench surface with a suitable disinfectant. The bench surface must be non-absorbent, so appropriate covers may be needed. Only essential items should be taken to the workbench. Anything else should be left outside the lab or away from the bench. You'll need a Bunsen burner. For work with microorganisms, use a roaring flame. Return the flame to yellow when you're not using the Bunsen. It's easier to see the yellow flame and therefore safer. You'll also need inoculating loop and wire, a glass spreader and a beaker of alcohol. This is used to sterilise the spreader and is kept well away from the Bunsen. You can cover the beaker with foil or a watch glass to minimise the risk of the alcohol catching fire. You'll need a container holding a suitable disinfectant solution into which you can put used pipettes and other contaminated equipment. They can then be disposed of safely and contamination and clutter is reduced. If you need to remove teats from pipettes, draw some disinfectant into the pipette, hold the tip below the disinfectant surface and then expel the contents and remove the teat. This avoids aerosol formation. Autoclaving is the most common method of sterilising apparatus before and after use. Because the pressure inside an autoclave is greater than normal atmospheric pressure, the water inside boils at a higher temperature than usual. For example, at 103 kilopascals, water boils at 121 degrees Celsius. Given sufficient time, the high temperature steam inside the autoclave will denature the proteins of any microbes and their spores and therefore kill them. It's important that the steam can reach all parts of the equipment to be sterilised and that enough time is allowed for the heat to penetrate to the centre of whatever is in the autoclave, for example, flasks of broth. The tops of containers placed inside the autoclave should be loosened and any cotton wool plugs covered with foil. Cotton wool should be non-absorbent. There are different types of autoclaves, ranging from the simple domestic pressure cookers through bench autoclaves to larger installations. You can buy indicators which change colour if autoclaving has been successful. Aseptic techniques prevent bench tops, apparatus and people from being contaminated by the microorganisms being used. They also prevent cultures from being contaminated by microorganisms from the environment. Throughout this video, you will see certain procedures being used again and again. These are fundamental aspects of aseptic technique and they must be performed if your work is to be safe and successful.
Flaming is simply heating equipment in a Bunsen flame. Loops, wires, spreaders and pipettes are all flamed in order to sterilise them, but a different technique is used for each. Loops and wires are flamed by heating them in the Bunsen flame until they glow red. Hold the loop or wire almost vertically pointing downwards in the roaring flame so that its whole length is heated and then allow it to cool before touching any cultures. Hot instruments not only kill the microbes you're trying to cultivate, but they can also create aerosols. Aerosols are virtually invisible and they can remain suspended in the air for some time. If you inhale an aerosol, you may also be breathing in microbes, which is potentially hazardous, of course. Microbe-laden aerosols can also contaminate the cultures you're working with. After inoculation, the loop or wire should be re-sterilised by introducing it into the Bunsen flame, but slowly to avoid further aerosols. Just insert the loop into the pale blue cone of the flame. Glass or plastic spreaders are sterilised using alcohol, not by heating them in the Bunsen flame. Because glass may snap, plastic will melt, and direct contact between the flame and microbes may result in an aerosol formation. The spreader is removed from the beaker and passed through the Bunsen flame to ignite the alcohol. This heats the spreader to about 60 degrees Celsius, which is enough to sterilise but not hot enough to break the glass. The spreader cools almost immediately. After use, it should be put back in the beaker. Bottles and other containers are always flamed by holding the neck briefly in the flame. This does not sterilise but creates convection currents around the neck which lift the air out and remove any microorganisms suspended in the air around the top of the container. This helps reduce contamination. The uplift of air carrying microorganisms away from the immediate area is another reason why all microbiological work is carried out near a Bunsen on a roaring flame. The convection current helps prevent aerial contaminants from falling onto where you are working. Bottle tops are held between the little finger and the palm of the pipette or loop hand. Screw the bottle into the lid, not vice versa. Never put any tops or lids on a bench, since they may be contaminated. Holding caps in the little finger also allows them to be replaced easily. This is difficult at first, but becomes easier with practice. It is a good idea to loosen bottle caps before work starts, because this makes handling the bottles easier when carrying out aseptic techniques. Pipettes are supplied sterile, either individually wrapped or packed into a container, whose top should be flamed on opening. Pipettes are flamed by flashing through the Bunsen flame in one continuous movement, and are discarded into disinfectant after use. Most microbiological work is carried out using petri dishes containing sterilized solid medium. These are known as agar plates. Simply take a sterile petri dish and gently pour in about 15 cubic centimeters of molten sterile medium. The plate is then swirled to ensure even coverage of the surface. Once the medium has set, the plate is ready to use. All dishes should be labeled with your name, the date, the name of the microorganism or the source of microorganisms. The base is labelled in preference to the lid because if the two halves become separated, the growth on the medium can still be identified. Plates are always dried with the base inverted and resting on the lid to reduce the risk of contamination. Plates can be dried in an incubator, but it's also okay to dry them on a bench where they won't be moved. When plates are being inoculated, they should be sealed with short pieces of tape. Do not seal them completely, or this may encourage the growth of potentially harmful and anaerobic bacteria. Cultures are incubated to allow the microorganism to multiply and grow, resulting in the formation of visible colonies on agar plates, or turbidity or cloudiness in broths. 
the optimum incubation temperatures vary depending on the microorganisms. It's generally agreed that in schools, 30 degrees Celsius is a suitable temperature for the incubation of bacterial cultures, whilst fungi should be incubated at 20 degrees Celsius. Bacteria are generally incubated for 24 to 48 hours, whilst fungi are incubated for 4 to 5 days. Cultures should not be incubated above 30 degrees Celsius, as this might encourage the growth of organisms capable of causing disease in humans. These organisms often have an optimum growth temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. However, there are several important exceptions. For example, yogurt making is generally done at 42 degrees Celsius, and some bacteria will only grow at 60 degrees Celsius. The substance used for the growth of bacteria and fungi in the lab is known as the medium. Media can be either solid or liquid. A liquid medium is known as a broth. There's no nutritional difference between solid and liquid media. Both contain all the necessary requirements for microbial growth. Solid media, however, contain agar as a solidifying agent. Agar is obtained from a type of seaweed and has no nutritional value, but it does have unique properties as a solidifying agent because it melts at 100 degrees Celsius and it sets at 40 degrees Celsius. It can be maintained at a molten state in a 50 degrees Celsius water bath. If microorganisms are added to molten agar, for example in pore plates, the agar should not be over 45 degrees Celsius. The bottle will be hot enough to hold in a hand without being uncomfortable. If it's too hot, the microorganism will be killed. If it's too cold, the agar will set and it'll need heating to 100 degrees Celsius again to be remelted. There are many different types of media containing various combinations of nutrients, but a good general medium for bacteria is nutrient agar. Fungi have different nutrient requirements from bacteria, and so nutrient agar is not the best medium for them, although they will appear as contaminants quite readily. Street plates are used to isolate bacterial colonies or yeast. One well-isolated colony usually grows from one bacterial cell deposited on the agar. It can be assumed that all cells in the colony are the same and the colony is pure. The isolated colonies can be used to inoculate fresh sterile agar plates on which pure cultures will grow. The properties of organisms in pure cultures can then be studied. Streaks are made using a wire loop on sterile agar medium in a petri dish. First, the loop is sterilized by heating and then allowed to cool. To inoculate from an existing plate, the plate lid is raised and the loop is used to remove part of a single, well-isolated colony. The lid is replaced and then the lid of the petri dish to be inoculated is raised and the first sector of the plate is streaked gently by drawing the loop across the surface of the agar. It's important not to press down on the surface of the medium as this can cause gouging and possibly unintentional growth of anaerobes below the surface of the agar. After streaking the first area of the plate, the lid should be replaced and the loop flamed and allowed to cool. The second sector of the plate should now be streaked by drawing some of the original inoculum from the first sector with the sterilized loop. Again, the lid is replaced and the loop flamed and cooled before streaking the third area of the plate, drawing from the second streak. After flaming the loop yet again, the final streak is taken by drawing from the third streak to the centre of the plate. The loop is then flamed once more. The plates are inverted and incubated. If the streaking has been successful, colonies should be clearly visible on the plate after incubation. Growth is confluent around initial streaks. The colonies grow and merge. 
The aim is to deposit most of the bacteria in the first few streaks. The subsequent streaking has a diluting effect, producing isolated colonies. Different bacteria may have different colony types, and this colony morphology can also depend on the culture medium used. These differences may be used to help with identification. The pore plate technique can also be used to isolate single colonies. It's easier to perform than streaking and consists of inoculating the culture into a sterile tube or bottle containing about 15 cubic centimetres of molten agar at 45 degrees Celsius. The suspension can't be too concentrated, otherwise confluent growth will be obtained rather than isolated colonies. The culture bottle is opened and flamed and between 0.1 and 1 cubic centimetre is removed using a pipette. Notice how the cap is held in the little finger of the pipette hand. The culture bottle is then reflamed and the top is replaced. The medium bottle is then opened and flamed and inoculated. The bottle is then reflamed, the top is replaced and the pipette is disposed of. Then, to mix the culture and medium, the bottle is gently rotated in the palms. This prevents bubbles developing in the agar. The mixture is poured into a sterile Petri dish. Notice that the lid of the Petri dish is never completely removed. Alternatively, the inoculum can be placed in an empty Petri dish and the molten medium poured over it. The Petri dish is swirled gently with fingertips on the lid to mix the medium and the bacteria before setting. Once the medium has set, the plate can be inverted and incubated. Colony growth takes place within the medium and on its top and bottom surfaces as each colony develops from a single cell present in the original inoculum. This method can be used for counting the number of bacteria present in a sample of liquid, as long as you know the dilution factor. A sheet of bacterial growth over the entire surface of the medium is called a lawn or confluent growth. Such plates can be used to assess the sensitivity of microorganisms to various reagents which claim to be antibacterial, for example, antibiotics, toothpaste, mouthwash and essential oils. Plates used for antibiotic sensitivity tests should be sealed and not reopened. There must be no subculturing from these plates. Lawns can be prepared in one of two ways. Firstly, the lawn can be created by flooding a sterile agar plate with the desired microorganism. To flood the agar plate aseptically, the culture bottle is opened and the neck is flamed. The lid of the Petri dish is then raised and enough bacterial culture to cover the surface of the agar is tipped onto the plate. This is usually about one cubic centimetre. The plate is then swirled, allowing the culture to cover the agar completely and to distribute the bacteria evenly. Any excess culture is discarded by tipping it into a solution of disinfectant. The plate should then be left to dry before incubation. A safer way to prepare a bacterial lawn is the spread plate method. This involves pipetting a smaller volume of bacterial culture, up to half a cubic centimetre, into the centre of an agar plate. The lid of the culture bottle is removed and the neck of the bottle is flamed. Using a sterile pipette, the required volume of the bacterial broth is removed. The neck of the culture bottle is then reflamed and the lid is replaced. With the lid of the Petri dish raised slightly, the culture is pipetted into the centre of the plate and the pipette is then discarded. The glass spreader is then dipped in the alcohol and flamed to sterilise it. To avoid the risk of fire, the beaker containing the alcohol should not be too near the Bunsen flame. When the spreader has cooled, it can be placed lightly on the surface of the agar. The dish should be rotated whilst the spreader is moved up and down and across the medium. Once the lawn has dried, reagents can be added to measure inhibition of growth. If the reagent to be tested is solid, it can simply be placed in the middle of the plate. If liquids are to be tested, wells must be cut into the medium and the contaminated agar plugs that are removed need to be disposed of appropriately. Alternatively, the substances may be impregnated into sterile discs of filter paper. Inhibition due to antibiotics is demonstrated by placing paper discs containing antibiotics onto the surface of the agar. 
clear zones around the discs or wells demonstrate inhibition of growth. Multi-discs can also be used to show inhibition of bacterial growth due to the presence of antibiotics. These are filter paper discs with a number of different antibiotics placed on spots around the edges of the discs. These are placed onto a bacterial lawn and again inhibition by antibiotics is indicated by a clear zone. Multi-discs are useful as they allow the testing of more than one antibiotic for antimicrobial properties. Slopes are a useful way of maintaining cultures. The slope is made by allowing molten agar to set in an inclined bottle. The slope shouldn't reach more than two-thirds of the length of a bottle. Slopes give a large surface area to a small volume of medium, usually 10 cubic centimetres. In other words, they maximise the area available for bacterial growth. Slopes are usually inoculated using a wire loop. The loop is flamed and allowed to cool before one well-isolated colony is picked up. The slope bottle is then opened and flamed and inoculated by drawing the loop against the surface of the agar, starting from the bottom of the slope and moving the loop from side to side towards the top. Once that has been done, the bottle neck should be flamed and the lid replaced. Stabs, or deeps as they're sometimes known, are used to culture anaerobic bacteria, but can also be used to separate aerobic and anaerobic bacteria in mixed culture. Whilst this procedure is commonly used in microbiological laboratories, it's not recommended for use in schools. This is because some pathogenic organisms grow successfully in anaerobic environments. With stabs, the medium is inoculated with a straight wire instead of a loop. Other than that, the procedure is identical to that used for the slopes. The stab bottle is opened, the neck flamed, and the medium inoculated by pushing the wire smoothly into it to a depth of 3 to 4 centimetres. The bottle should then be reflamed, the top replaced, and the wire flamed to sterilise it. Growth of anaerobic bacteria will be evident at the base of the agar wound, as there's little or no oxygen at this depth. If you want to look at individual bacterial cells rather than the growth of cultures, you'll need to use a microscope. The Gram stain is the most important stain in bacteriology. It divides bacteria into two groups, called Gram-positive and Gram-negative, and provides an important initial identification step. Examination of the stained smear at high magnification will also allow you to see the shape of individual cells and any other characteristic features such as arrangement of cells or the presence of spores. To prepare a gram stain, you must firstly make a slide with a heat-fixed smear of the organism being investigated. Degrease the slide by breathing onto it and wiping it, and then label it with the name of the organism that you're going to stain. Flame a wire loop to sterilise it, and then place a loop full of water on the slide. Reflame the loop and pick up a very small part of a single isolated colony of your test bacteria and mix it with the water on the slide to form a very slightly cloudy suspension. Spread the smear across the slide. It's important that the smear isn't too thick because you'll need to see individual cells under the microscope. If you're using a broth culture for your stain, shake the bottle to suspend the cells and then place a loop full of broth on the slide, omitting the water. Reflame the loop when you've finished. Dry the slide. Air drying is best, but if you're pushed for time, rock the slide gently in the warm air above a Bunsen flame to speed the process up.
To finish the smear process, you must now heat fix the smear by quickly passing it, smear facing downwards, through the Bunsen flame three or four times. Now place the slide on a staining rack over a staining tray or sink with the smear facing upwards. Flood the smear with crystal violet solution and leave it for one minute. The smear will now be stained purple. After the minute has passed, tip the stain off the slide into the tray. Then rinse the slide, front and back, with water and place it back on the tray, again with the smear facing upwards. Cover the smear with iodine solution and leave it for another minute. The iodine fixes the purple stain in the cell. The smear will now appear a darker purple blue. Now wash the smear with 95% ethanol. You should do this quickly until the runoff is clear or a pale violet. When you've reached that point, immediately rinse the slide with water and place it back on the tray. The smear will now be purple blue or unstained. At this stage, crystal violet has been leached from gram-negative cells by the alcohol, but remains in gram-positive cells. The next step is to counter-stain the smear by covering it with safranin solution for 30 seconds and then rinsing it with tap water. Gram-negative cells will be stained pinky-red by the safranin, but gram-positive cells will still be purple. Blot dry the smear with fibre-free blotting paper or filter paper, being careful not to use any sideways motions as this could remove or alter the smear. The stain is ready to be examined. Use a microscope with an oil immersion lens.